LG has been making phones for so long that they stopped. This ended in 2021 with the last flagship phone being the LG V60 Thin Q 5G, which is a very long name for such short words. But three years after its launch, how does the LG V60 hold up? And more importantly, what's going on with the pricing? Hello everyone, this is Matt from Real World Review, and it's not too often that I get to review an LG phone. I wonder why. Anyway, let's talk about this heavy duty phone. And yes, just like all the other V series and some of the G series, this phone is military standard 810G certified. Just like how the LG V30 and newer are IP68 dust and water resistant. With that said, this phone is an LG Velvet and it is military standard 810G certified as well. And really, you'd be surprised at what phones can actually qualify for that title, but they just don't wanna pay for the certification. Same thing with water and dust resistance. But one thing that you do want to consider is that this phone is about three years old, so the dust and water resistant seals are probably wearing out, so keep this away from water. But when you look at this phone, the back is all curved grill glass 6 with a metal ring around the glass camera area. This is where the two main camera sensors are, and right next to it are the somewhat pointless other two sensors. And finally, the dual LED camera flash. Moving to the frame, we get a nice aluminum frame that hides the antenna bars. Actually, that's only true on the Verizon one. For some reason, they painted over the frame to hide the antennas. I don't know why. On the top, we get a microphone and a SIM slot that includes an SD card slot as well. Now that we're here, you can actually see the other microphone slot that's right above that second camera. You see it? Then on the left, we get another microphone hole as well as volume buttons and a Google Assistant key. I believe there's a way to turn that off, but I kind of just left it on. Then on the right side, we get a lonely power button. The bottom is where the headset jack is, and yes, this phone does have a 32-bit quad DAC system. If you know, then you know. But I don't, so I can't really tell you how mind-blowing that is, but people still want that. Then we get another microphone and a USB-C 3.1 port that allows for 25 watts of wired charging, but there's also wireless charging support up to 15 watts. Then we get the bottom loudspeaker, which pairs with the earpiece speaker to give us a fairly good stereo feel. With that said, the quality is not my favorite, sounding just not good once it gets too loud and starts vibrating the phone like crazy. It does get very loud though, so it's good for not missing a phone call. Just music quality might not be the best. While we're at the front of the phone, let's talk about that screen. Covered with Gorilla Glass 5, for some reason, this thick bezeled screen is an OLED display at 1080p, giving us the pixel density of 395 pixels per inch and a refresh rate of 60 hertz. The refresh rate is commonplace for LG phones, with LG never releasing a 90 or 120 hertz refresh rate officially, but it definitely doesn't feel good if you're used to 90 hertz phones or higher, because this phone does drop frames at times. As for video and images, not too bad. Viewing content is amazing on this phone, especially at low volumes or with headphones. Remember the headset jack on the bottom? It gets fairly bright at a little over 500 nits and was never an issue for me. There is no HDR brightening on the screen, which is kind of weird because even some cheaper phones have that feature. We do get the always on display and double tap to wake and sleep, of course, with LG bringing both features into the mainstream years ago. Then we have the in-screen fingerprint scanner and just like the LG Velvet and Wing, it's annoying. It is low and kind of works, but the lack of face detection is what's annoying to me. It's something you live with, but if I wanted to do that, I would have just stuck with a Pixel 6 Pro. On the top, there is a U cutout for the front camera, which looks ugly, but reminds me that the LG K92 and Q92 were the only hole-punch LG phones that released. The rest had notches like this, or even worse. As for the size, you know that this phone is going to be huge. I mean, it's taller than most tall phones, but keeping the weight okay at about 219 grams. Okay, that's heavy, but it is a pretty tall phone. Moving inside the phone, let's talk about the reason why you would want to buy this phone. We get a Snapdragon 865 chip with 8GB of RAM and 128GB of UFS 3.0 storage, which again, is expandable. The RAM doesn't look expandable, but 8GB should be enough for most people. Gaming and usage overall is fine, but there are just some weird graphical things that happen in this operating system that just make this phone feel slower or glitchier than it really is. And that 60Hz refresh rate does not help either. I mean, even things like unlocking the phone with the fingerprint scanner, it just blacks out the screen. LG really wasn't thinking. And I guess technically I should say they're not thinking because we're still running a three month old security patch of Android 12 with hopes that Android 13 is going to arrive. And that's the aspect that brings this really awesome phone down. As for battery life, it's actually not that bad. 
It's a 5,000 milliamp cell and maybe I just got a newer phone, but this battery life is superb. For my test, I'm looking at about five to seven hours of screen on time on a 5G ultra wideband phone. Like I said, we get 25 watts of wired charging, but it doesn't really charge as fast as I would like for some reason. Lastly, we get Bluetooth 5.1 and Wi-Fi 6 support, which I guess was a standard at launch for its price point. Like I said, this phone is awesome, but gets run down by LG software. And as time goes on, LG will give up on software updates as they should. But the issue is that this phone has almost a cult-like following with no custom ROM support. I mean, it makes sense because they want it to be secure, but if LG isn't making phones anymore, they should allow for more modding and just let it go. Now, I might be spoiled in the availability of good camera phones because this is not my favorite. For one, the front camera is very capable but fails in my eyes. This is a 10 megapixel sensor that can actually focus, but the quality is just not there. We even get 4K 60 frames per second video out of this sensor, but to me it is just lacking. Give it some light and you get some decent shots, but low light does not let this camera live. Then we go to the back cameras and I'm getting pretty much the same results in low light, but normal light is where it gets a lot better. We get a 64 megapixel wide angle sensor that shoots 16 megapixel shots normally, though there is an option for the whole 64 megapixels. This camera does allow for video to be captured at 4K 60 frames per second and even 8K at 24 frames per second, but it does feel closer to 30 than 24. And the reason I think that it might be higher is because in the manual camera, you can actually push it to 26 frames per second, which is weird. Then the ultra wide is a fixed focus 13 megapixel sensor that has a pretty close aperture at f1.9 to the f1.8 on the main, but with a lack of focusing and night capabilities, it doesn't matter. I would say that it's pretty close in quality to the main sensor though. And lastly, we get a time of flight sensor, but personally give me a telephoto sensor. I think since the 64 megapixel camera is good enough to produce a 2x shot, even though it doesn't seem to be cropping in on that sensor, that LG thought that time of flight was better. This is used for focusing and AR and possibly other stuff that people don't care about, but I don't see the benefits to this sensor. Not to mention that it takes up a decent amount of space with that other sensor attached to it. And if I'm not obvious, I don't actually hate these cameras. I'm just speaking in the mindset of a person that bought this phone brand new. Instead, at less than $200, which is what I paid for this phone, these cameras are years ahead of new phones at this price point. But at the end of the day, I'm showing you the phone, so I'll let you be the judge. To me, this is a phone with two cameras on the back, even though they make it seem like it's way more. I don't mind the cameras looking like this, I just wish it was more like the S10 5G setup. Now I just mentioned the S10 5G, which is pretty similar to this phone, even in used pricing. The main difference is capabilities, and in a perfect world, that's what makes the LG V60 a better buy. But at under $200, this phone is perfect to buy when compared to phones that you can buy in carrier stores. But there's a reason why this phone is so cheap, and that's the name that's attached to it. Not the LG V60 ThinQ 5G Ultra Wideband name, but the LG name. Like I said, software support will end, and eventually this phone will become just another V-series phone, pointless and not supported. So you will need to take that into consideration. But to use this phone in 2023, or maybe even 2024, I feel like this is going to be a perfect buy, especially if you just have to wait for your contract to be up, or whatever terrible things carriers are doing nowadays. And really, you should be sticking to used phones, just like this one. It's better for the environment. And that's my review of the LG V60 ThinQ 5G, the phone that has four or five names, but only needs three or five letters. But what do you think about this phone? 
Should we let go of LG? Did you just now understand my play on words here instead of at the end of the hardware section? Let me know in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.